Thank you.
have some business to take care of. Our auction just closed, and if you want an item, you will probably receive a notification. Um, my executive director, Stephanie, is out there, and she has, um, she can give you the items that you want. Um, for those of you who want remotely, I will send them to you, don't worry. Um, Kate has some winners from our giveaway. So we're yes. gonna do that quickly. Here it comes. All right, so we have our giveaway of the bags with all the Tofa swag in it. So they are Nancy Crow. <laughs> Abby Nelson. Thank you for inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure to hear all your people who've been playing and uh, look forward to the cello choir. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about box suites, but I hate to disappoint you, but I don't think anything, nothing is best, right? People play box differently, and there's no one answer. And so my life experience uh, to this point has led me here, and uh, maybe you'll find something you can relate to. So Bach solo suites for cello. First thing is, what instrument did Bach intend for it uh, going to be played on, and is that important? And I thought I'd start by showing you some, seven, some pictures that we might say, oh, that's a cello. But actually, none of these pictures are cellos. Uh, this is over here, I'm just signing. So here's a, a 17th century Dutch still life with one, two, three, four, five strings on this big bass instrument. I think they might be. Oh, here it is. Cecilia with an instrument with six strings. Uh, maybe a gamba family. So we tend to think of the gamba family as having another shape, but there are plenty of examples, particularly Italian ones, that have this. Shape. Here's a man in a, in a uh, Dirk Hals painting singing to his own accompaniment on a big instrument. Notice he's holding it on his left. Uh, he doesn't have to worry about a rock stop or any kind of head, head holder. He's holding out his left foot. And here's another one. Is she holding a piece of music? I don't know what she's doing up there. Again, not sure, but I'm sure there's a, a, the art historians have made a narrative for this. I hope you have been noticing that all of these players of these big instruments have been holding the bow underhand now, so far. Now here's someone where you can really see on a lot of these instruments, uh, two things. One, you know if you look at your cello that the neck is set into, oops, sorry, is set into a dovetail like this in the top block. And since it goes back in this way, it can't tip forward. But the old style, and therefore the, the top of your cello is cut away a little bit where the neck slides in. But the old way was to, before the top got put on, to nail this neck assembly onto the block. You can see that in radiographs or x-rays of old instruments. Sometimes when the necks have been reset but retained, you can see a hole that's been filled in where that nail used to come through. But as a result, often this curve is quite thick at the fourth position area. And the neck kind of tapers as you go up 
like this, and not what you feel where you are here, but you feel where you are this way, too. And that's certainly the case here. Here's a musical family. Again, a four-stringer plays what they have. And these would have been strung with gut strings all the way down to the very bottom, like this one is. Sometimes the lower strings were referred to in the 17th century as cat ones, so a cat line, which is also the kind of, it's the kind of rope used in nautical rigging and is made by braiding uh, things together rather than just twisting the gut. So those strings you, uh, you shift, you hear as you pass. Sometimes they had uh, soaked the gut in some kind of heavier mineral salts to give it weight because when we're talking about low pitches, of course, we're talking about a string of a given mass uh, can only be relaxed in tension so far until it's you know, just flabby. Um, so the idea had to be to make these instruments as big as possible with the hand, um, but in order to make these strings work. And there was a revolution that happened sometime in the middle or second, slightly after the middle of the 17th century, which is that people learn how to wind wire on the gut strings. Give it more mass, therefore the same pitch could be achieved with a smaller string length. The big instrument was often called the violone. The violino being the Italian word, O-N-E being a suffix meaning something big. You might have had tortellini, those little round dumplings, uh, or they're quite common, but less common are the tortellone, which are the big ones, <laughs> but the same kind of thing. So the violone was the violino with O-N-E added on and a little bit of cleaning up in the middle. Um, and the violoncello then was what these big instruments could become once they had these new strings. They could become violone cello, violoncello, by lopping off that E and putting it together. So literally, a little big violin. <laughs> so join me in my effort to stamp out the misspelling of our instrument as B-I-O-L-I-N-C-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. That would be a tiny little violin, right? <laughs> Instead of a, a small, big instrument. So string technology is very, very important. Now, what happened to all those big instruments? If you read the Hill book on Stradivari, you'll see a listing of instruments that are like well over 30 inch back length, which is quite big. This is one of, this is often called the earliest extant cello. It's an instrument that's now in the collection of the National Music Museum in Vermilion, South Dakota. Not so far from here, worth a pilgrimage, certainly. Um, and it's by Andrea Amati, the first in the long line of that family dynasty. And it's called The King. It was made somewhere in the middle of the 16th century and by 1670 something, it had acquired these decorations which had to do with the reign of Charles IX of France. Around the edges, and there were several instruments that survived from this set of 24 Amati instruments that were supposedly made for Charles IX or used in his court. There were small and big violins, big violas, really big violas, same problem with the low strings. They didn't go out of first position generally. Next were very short, 18 inch body length, and these big instruments, most of which have been cut down. Um, there are about 64 Strad instruments that survive what we call cellos now. About half of them were made before 1702, and of those half, only four or five, five I think, survived that haven't been cut down to make them more full size, usual full size. So what's happened to this instrument? Like the other ones, it has this decoration here. And also what we don't see here is around the edges on the ribs was painted the king's motto, Pieta e Justitia, Piety and Justice. And here's Justice holding a sword in her one hand, but poor lady has only one arm. 
she should be holding a scale in the other arm. She was at one time, but this instrument was cut down here and about this much removed and put back together and also cut along the edges. So as the, the top of the bottom of the plate, of the edges of the plate. So you know that if you run your finger over the arching of your instrument, it kind of does this into the purfling channel. And when you see a big shuttle cut down, it's like falling off the edge of the earth onto the rib. The ribs, you see, see a pieta, have letters missing because, of course, when the outline of the instrument was cut down, the ribs had to be cut down to fit. So, here's someone playing a slower instrument, still underhand. This is Judith Leister, Harlem painter at the school of uh, Franz Hals. Uh, and this is some sort of foreshortening for it. But it's interesting to play a little instrument on the table. This is 1701, French overhand grip. Very small instrument. This is 1742. Dietzi was a uh, caricaturist. Maybe you know a famous picture of his, a drawing of his of uh, Vivaldi with a huge nose and looking down. And here's a, here's a guy playing with his reading glasses and holding a smallish instrument. Johann Joachim Krantz in 1752 uh, writes a book called Verzugan Anweisung die Flöten Klavier zu spielen, a method for playing the transverse flute. It's a big book and uh, it addresses the flute, of course, but also everything else about music that he knew. There are chapters to the violinist in particular, to the violist, to the cellist, to the harpsichordist, and so on, as well as big chapters about how music and musicians are to be judged. And he says in the chapter to the cellist, first of all, it's silly to try to play solos on this instrument. Really, what it's good for is to accompany and what you have to supply in those empty brackets is to accompany the flute, of course. <laughs> uh, but he goes on to say, if you actually have to play solos, then you have to have a small instrument and a big instrument for orchestral playing. So there are still these two sizes, and it's kind of a spurious uniformity of sizes in the cello world. Not, uh, it's worse maybe than in the viola world. You know, violas, the small ones, small people, or violinists who occasionally venture there will play a 15 and a half inch viola, and anything over about 16 and three quarters or so today is inches, I'm talking about the back length, is considered very big, and 17 and a quarter is, and these 18 inch, these huge instruments that were made, in the 17th century there was often a five part string choir with three middle parts played by different sized violas, and so the bigger ones could play the fourth line, these instruments would play the, the bottom line. Here is It's always fun to look at these title pages to get to see what it is. Uh, violin on concertino, pentamina, a violone e violoncello, so there's our word, real violoncello, dedicated to his, his Royal Highness Francesco II, Duke of Modena, blah, 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 etc., by Giuseppe Torelli, Veronese, uh, opera quarta. This, I think, is something like 16. 90 or something like, like that. Uh, and here's the violin part with this nice illustration, preludio, and then the violinist. Right? There's a cello part too. The viola, the viola cello da spalla. I'm sure you're, many of you are aware of that some old instruments have that, uh, some kind of plug in the back where it was thought there was a knob attached to have a kind of a sling, and these are something called processional cellos or what have you. But this is an instrument which is certainly 
small-ish by full-size standards and play this way. And there's quite a lot of possible. This is stuff called Cosa Italiana, and here's a guy playing such a thing, too. Now, unfortunately, I hate to admit it, but I have to. Unfortunately, Bach's pieces for the violoncello piccolo seem to be, uh, some of them, designed to be played by a violinist. Fortunately, in those days, often people learn like all the treble instruments or all the bass instruments. So someone could be a recorder player and an oboist and a violinist. And um, further, um, even more unfortunate is, is a rather convoluted thing, and I'll try, I won't try to sort it out completely, but just mention these strings. After Bach's death, there were several people who talked about the fact that he had invented with an instrument maker in Leipzig named Hoffmann an instrument called the viola pomposa. Now, there was some music for the viola pomposa that uh, survives by other composers, uh, but Bach seems to have done something for this. There's an instrument in the Leipzig Museum, and there's another instrument in the Bachhaus and Eisenach, they claim to be these viola pomposas. They have ribs that are almost four inches deep, so it's unlikely you could actually play it on your chin, but you might be able to play it this way. And of the, there are about 13 or so cantata parts, movements from Bach with obbligato violoncello piccolo. Some of them can be played on an instrument tuned like a violin, maybe not the lower. Some of them need a low C string, it's about half and half. And the thing that's hard as a cellist to admit is that when I've looked at all the surviving parts, these arias are copied into the violin part in about half the instances. So it could have been like many other instances for Bach. When a Virtuoso was in town, a flutist, for instance, there are a lot of cantatas, one after another every Sunday, that require good flute parts. 1724 seems to be a time when these Violoncello piccolo parts were particularly prevalent for a while. Anyway, um, we don't really, the, the point of it is, we don't really know what the instrument was for which Bach wrote it, except it was called violoncello, and therefore it was a little more nimble than the big violone. Okay, I'll come back to this here. Second thing, sweets. What are sweets? Suites are pieces which are linked together and probably have something to do with dances, at least in part. We know there were, uh, early in the rest of the Renaissance, paired dances like the Pavon and the Galliard, <coughs> sometimes using the same melodic material. Um, keyboard suites in the 17th century, lute suites, uh, had a number of, of uh, Dances, the sort that was later by musicologists called the German suite, the Colonel, was uh, the Allemand, the Courant, the Cerebon, and the Gide. But when they first appeared in keyboard music of Froberger, sometimes the Gide was first, sometimes the order was other. Um, in the 17th century in France, sometimes, and even in the early 18th century, you find huge suites with four preludes and three almonds and six, no, three courants. So you, in other words, you can kind of do a one from column A, one from column B idea to put together a suite. They were all organized by key, at least, and Bach does that too. So what do we know about dancing? Well, this is from uh, an illustration from a dance manual from about 1700, and you can see that here's the king or the duke or whatever he was, seated at the end and the couples come and they dance in that way. How do we know what they danced? Well, a number of these French methods were translated into various other uh, uh, languages. This is from a book by uh, a 20th century dance historian, but shows some pictures from Pierre Rameau, not to be confused with the composer, 
from about 1700 showing the basic, uh, some of the basic positions uh, how you stand. One thing that's common for almost all of these except this one is that you never stand like this, right? That's not elegant. You stand like this. Or, and if you think about, I should have a slide, but maybe you can conjure these images. Michelangelo David, the David of Michelangelo in Florence, right? Stands there beautifully, wonderful male nude figure, but you can almost imagine the huge block of marble from which that was carved. And contrast that, you're now in the Villa Borghese in Rome, Bernini, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, wonderful Baroque sculptor, David, is in the act of getting his sling ready, and he's like this. You can feel all the energy there, and you don't ever think that it's a stone anymore. It's almost living. So that's kind of the, uh, you must know the famous picture of Louis XIV by Rigo, where he stands in his ermine cloak and with his dancing legs. And they all have kind of high heels. That's on screen. This shows how the feet are to be arranged. And this is a choreography uh, manual that became the most popular method for notating these things by a man named Fouillet. And these show various things of how the, the steps were accomplished. So that you could have music. Oh, sorry, wrong clef. This is a French violin clef, so it's G clef on the bottom line. You can read it like bass clef. So not da da da. Well, it's a beret, first of all, because it has one upbeat, rough up, could be subdivided, up, up, but it isn't. And here are the way the two dancers dance this much. Now, what's important to remember is that I said last hour that if you were an auditor and someone played an alamon for you, you want to recognize that it's an alamon and you might think you want to, from your seat, you know, feel like you're getting up ready to dance. Well, these dances all unfold over space, over time, as well as space. So I tell my students always that a good way to practice with their university students, three o'clock in the morning in the dorm, most of the parties have calmed down, you know, go out and walk in the corridors your piece. <laughs> That's going to make you dance. Just kind of take a deep breath and sing through it all. Isn't it? Here's a minuet, same kind of thing, man and woman. Uh, this kind of minuet is often in a different kind of view, a bird's eye view, described like a big Z. The man starts here, the woman starts here. They cross and they end up here. So here they are midway through, and here they are at the end. Space. It was not confined to France or the English Tomlinson, but the figure of the dance master was important to all of them. It's a German uh, book about 1700 listing the occupations in a city. And the French dance master was very important. Bach knew several French dance masters. Okay, then what about the sources for uh, how we deal with it? Well, the first three, you all know the story of Casals, I'm sure, who made a big deal about he found in this dusty bin in the, the Barcelona uh, music shop, Bach suites, and he was so excited he took them, he practiced for 10 years before he played them in public. And the whole idea seems to be that he single-handedly resurrected the pieces not too far off the mark, maybe a little ego inflating, but what you forget to ask in all your excitement about his excitement about discovering pieces, well, who published them? Well, by that time, there were already several dozen uh, uh, publications, starting in uh, 1824 by uh, Norbert, who was a uh, French cellist. I didn't give the uh, 
uh, little, little note to the reader that he does, but he says basically, Bach wrote for violin and uh, suites and sonatas, or keyboard, the French suites, English suites, the partitas, and to make the third element in our modern day piano trio have the same advantage, we have found these pieces and decided to publish them because they're very hard to come by. Okay. So what is it called? Sonatas or etudes for cello solo. Next year, 1720, uh, sorry, 1825, uh, this is, uh, we don't know who edited it, it was published by Probst, a German one. Six sonatas or etudes again, very, very simple, published in Leipzig. And uh, here's Dotzauer, we all know him, by 1727. Six solos or etudes for the cello, all the classics by Bach. Avec les droites et les coutachés indiqués, like this, with Dotzauer's uh, fingerings and bowing indicated. In the, the Bach Gesellschaft, which was begun in 1850 as an idea for the first time to get a complete edition of all Bach's works together. These also figured, of course, and there were a number of other, you've probably seen a lot of them, a number of other editions, but I'm going to skip to 1988 in the Bach Ausgabe, the new Bach edition, which was started in uh, 1950. By 1988, they'd gotten to the six weeks for cello solo. And if you looked at this, um, I'm just looking at this nice catalog from Bernard. It does, they don't list this one <laughs> anymore. Uh, Hans Epstein looked at the four surviving manuscripts and made a decision. Uh, the four surviving manuscripts None of them come from Bach. One they, they call A is Anna Magdalena's copy, right? B is one that a man who copied a lot of Bach's music was a student, Johann Peter Kellner copied. Um, it has a, well, we'll get to that this way. Uh, there's one that was in the possession of an organist named Westphal. There was one that is in the, uh, the, the Austrian National Library in Vienna that served as an addition, uh, you could order it and it would be copied out as a lot of things were published in that time. And then there are, then there is the, uh, some other things. H is a lute manuscript or the lute version of the fifth suite. Obviously there was a Bach autograph at some point. Whether it was actually sit down and have six suites together or individual suites, we don't know. It's lost, so it's described as source F in brackets. And it's, it's surmised that Anna Magdalena's copy, A, was copied directly from that. These other ones seem now, in the best historical sources, that to have been copied from another manuscript which doesn't survive anymore either. And maybe it was this manuscript that she copied in 1727 or so. But we know that Kellner, to who dates it, is by 1726, these suites were together. You'll often hear they were composed in about 1720. We know the violin pieces were composed then, but we're not really sure about the cello pieces. Okay, so here is the, here's the copy by Anna Magdalena Bach, provided with someone else's uh, title page. Six suites, that's a French word. Uh, Violoncello solo, that's an Italian word. Senza basso, that's more Italian. Composé par uh, Johannes Martin Bach, Maître de Chapelle, that's all French. So maybe there is something to this, as Francois Coupra was trying at that time, a little bit earlier, maybe to bring about the, what he called perfection of taste with the union of French and Italian taste. What Telemann would talk about, the vermischte Geschmack, the, again, the mixed taste. Compose, uh, there's, there's another title that goes with this, with the copy of the violin pieces, that suggests, it really says they're written by Mrs. Bach. And someone, 
I don't remember the fellow's name, wrote a whole study about the, piece, the cello pieces really being written by and, is, and composed as, instead of copied out by Mrs. Bach. I'm sorry to say, total nonsense. Don't buy it. <laughs> Don't go it. Now, we have a beautifully autographed uh, copy of the manuscript of the violin sonatas by Bach himself. I say copy because it's too clean to be a composing score. And here it is over here. And here is Anna Magdalena, who also made a copy of it. Now, if I just look anywhere here, as a string player, I see and here, if I really see carefully what's here, it looks like the da 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 a Bach autograph and I'm going to copy. And she's always pushing them over to the right somehow. So if you had to say, look at this. Da 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 bum dee da da bum. As opposed to da dee dee da 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 da. Huh. It's not very accurate. Now, on a real song, plays these suites, I'll say it, I think better than anybody else ever ever heard, but he, he had a theory that what he looked at as Anna Magdalena was actually her betterment of what Bach had done, or Bach's betterment and related through her. And in his book, Bach the Fencing Master, which is full of very good things, it starts out with kind of transcription of how he sees the slurs in the Alban for the first suite, or the Quran, I can't remember. And the first words in the piece, in the book are, Voila, the slurs as they appeared to me on July 19th, 1987. So, you know, which kind of gives you a lot of room to squint and see if something else happened. But anyway, that's a problem with her. Problem with Kellner is that he copied out a lot of Bach's music and uh, uh, but he seems to have copied for his own use for some other purpose. For instance, he copies the most of the C minor suite, writing those chords that are obtainable only with the scoratura, but doesn't mention the scoratura, and makes a number of mistakes related to transcribing the scoratura. So I can't really trust his bowings either. These other two versions, Suites and Prelude in Prelude, uh, this is the one that was in, seems to have come out of the circle of CPE Bach, and was copied by someone who was uh, very meticulous. And this, although it looks like it's horrible, all those dots are what's called tintenfras, when the ink, which has a lot of tannic content over the years, eats through the paper. So you're seeing the back sides of what's on the, or you're seeing what's on the other side of this page. Uh, you can even read it. Da -da -de -da -de -da -de -da -da. <laughs> But uh, this also looks much clearer. It's much easier to see. Now, Epstein was convinced in his Neue Bach Ausgabe edition of 1988 that uh, he, he tried to do what the musicolog musicologists do, which is to get a best reading by sifting this all together. But there was so much hue and cry from various pre-publication readers of this, including Nicholas Harnikor, <coughs> that uh, he decided he printed in, in that edition. The notes are printed twice. In the first part, they are printed in the best reading that he saw between Anna Magdalena and Kellner, and in the second half from these other two. But the Neubach Ausgabe, when it was complete and people who had been subscribing to it for 35 years had gotten their last volume and paid their last check, they were disappointed to learn about three weeks later that the editorial board had decided that about 15 volumes had been not done right and they were going to do them again. So that people have to shell out even more money. And this now by Andrew Kala is the new idea behind the, uh, his edition, which is the one that is out there for choice in the new Bach edition. 
I should have mentioned there's also still a Baronrider one that was really very well done for his time by August Menzinger. So in order to help him make his edition, he made something he calls a synoptic edition. It's a separate volume. And here is the beginning of the failure from Anna Magdalena, from Kellner, from Vesbala, from the Genius and Rams, plus from Norblad, the first edition. And you can see you can sort of figure out what happened. Maybe, or is this really? Then separate, and then, I mean, you can go crazy trying to do this. And I just remember that nice, concise phrase uh, Traductore, traditore. He who translates is inevitably a traitor to the original, right? So I would say, study all of this, it's great, but it's, what Tali comes up with in his edition is his conjecture, and he says, I, this is probably this loss, what, close to what this loss source G looked like, but no one can say for sure. Okay, I just want to point out one thing, and I'm going to play something for you. If I can, after all this time. This is the minuet, right? Uh, from the first suite, the second minuet. Now, it's in G minor, we would expect two blanks. But in Germany, particularly, there was a kind of an adherence, even at this time, to an older style of writing, kind of in Dorian mode. So C minor has two flats. and G minor has what looks like one flat. This is again a duplicate flat, two B flats there, right? So G da 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 da. There's B flat da 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 da. Why is that there? Is it because the the signature is incomplete? Okay. Da 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 da. Now there's not one here in Almagdalena. There's a flat here in Keller. It's not here. Here's something. Not here. So, okay. A natural, a flat, a natural, uh, a C, <laughs> or no, a natural. I mean, you can study it, you can use the size of the play. Someone once told me early on in my career, well, you can't um, footnote a performance, and that's true. So, let me make a body of this. after all this talking, try to play for you some Bach. So where did this idea of playing unaccompanied music come from? Well, one is, of course, 17th century violin music, particularly things like uh, Walter and Schmelzer, Bieber, Austrian masters, right? <laughs> So German, now the play. Bach, of course, doesn't do that. These three gamelons are really they're wonderful pieces, but they are not very idiomatic to the gamma. And the most idiomatic thing he ever wrote was in the Matthew Fashion. Sorry. Steps there. Right. So there's one possibility for solo music for a basic unaccompanied. Another is from one of the 
earliest piece that we have that mentions the violoncello, and that is from Richard Carr's of Gabrielli, a wonderful pieces. And then we have our great pieces. <laughs> Six uh, by uh, Francesco Ruggeri. Ruggeri seemed to have experiment with these small forms. How small can you get? It's quite small. This, you know, modern uh, people call this five eighths. Doesn't sound five eighths to me, but. synoptic version and say, oh, you played one extra slur in the fifth bar. I might. I don't know. about a few repeats, which I wouldn't normally do, but for time's sake.
Thank you.